Mentors Collective, thank you for tuning in. If you're an agency owner, or maybe you're a new entrepreneur and thinking about starting an agency for your first time, which I highly recommend because it's what I did, it's what I teach, it doesn't cost you anything up front, and it teaches you a lot of the skills that you're going to need to be successful in any area of business. So if you're thinking about starting an agency or you already have one, this episode is going to be for you. I have got the king of agencies with me on this podcast who has been in the agency game since 1995. He now helps mentor other agencies, buying and selling agencies, and helping them uh, blow past their current plateaus. So Drew McClellan, thank you so much for joining me. Super pumped to talk to you about agencies today. Ah, thanks for having me. I'm looking forward to it. I'd love to ask you first, how has the agency game changed since you first got in? Like, what kind of changes have you seen in the industry? What shifts? Well, I mean, think about it. Think, you know, the late 90s, uh, you know, we had clients telling us they needed a website and we were like, why would you need a, why do you need a website, right? right. And that today, all the way to AI today and all of the things that are happening, you've got international privacy laws, you've got all kinds of technology. And one of the big things that's changed is, you know, when I started in the business and 95 was when I started my own agency. So I had worked for other agencies even deeper than that. But, um, you know, it was, it was all about the creative and today and the, and the creatives were the cool kids. And today, honestly, it's the digital kids that are the cool kids. And um, it is about technology and leveraging technology to communicate the message better. In some ways, it hasn't changed at all. It is still about matching the right prospect with the right product, whatever that may be, and the storytelling around that. And then how do you how do you connect that? How do you create the raving fan around your brand? So in some ways, that hasn't changed at all. But how we do it has changed dramatically. And probably the biggest change is the rate of change. So, you know, you, th you think about, you know, if anybody listening watch Mad Men, you know, they had television, just they had radio, and they had print, show. right? And that was it. And now just think about, just think about the broadcast channels alone that a product or service has access to, let alone all the other ways we can communicate with people. So the biggest, the biggest shift is that although the storytelling and the purpose of what we do is the same, how we do it is dramatically different and how we do it today will be absolutely different than how we do it a year from now. That's so interesting. Do you think, because obviously back in the day, there was less competition, right? But there was less competition for the attention. But now there's more ways to get that attention. Do you yep. think it's easier to run an agency now or do you think it was easier back in the, in the late 90s? I think it's more interesting to run an agency now because back then, Everybody was basically, we produce paid advertising, we get paid the same way, and we're either going to make television commercials, radio spots, or print ads for magazines or newspapers. Right. Today, you can be an influencer agency. Today, you can be a PPC and SEO agency. Today, you can be a PR firm. And, and there's so much nuance in all of the ways that you can serve a client, and they all have a viable place. So is it easier? No. Uh, is it more interesting? Yeah, of course it is. I love that you mentioned all the different niches under that giant marketing umbrella, the specializations mm -hmm. that marketing agencies can take. And, you know, I run a PR agency and I run a lead gen agency. So I'm wondering from your perspective there, if you're talking to somebody who's starting an agency right now, what is your advice to them? Do they try and start a do it all for you marketing agency or do they subspecialize? What do you, what do you suggest? Well, so I'm going to argue that there are three ways to specialize. Every agency has to figure out how to differentiate themselves in the market. Otherwise, your only choice is to differentiate by price, which is yes. never, you know, the, the the chosen path. So if you're going to differentiate yourself, you have three options. You can be an expert in an industry, which would, to your point, mean that in most cases, you're going to offer a wider range of services. You can be a specialist in an audience. Like we know how to reach millennial moms better than anybody else and have influence over them. Again, probably wider in terms of your offerings, or you're going to be a skill set. So we're a PR firm. We are an Amazon marketplace agency. We're an influencer agency. So all of those are possible. The challenge is that for 
an agency that specializes in a deliverable, you're not going to be distinct for that long. So I can remember when social agencies, when you were, if you were a social agency, you were very different than everybody else. Now people have already been social agencies and they're walking away from that. You know, Amazon Marketplace, Influencer, those are hot things today. And yes, today you may be a, one of a handful of agencies that does that. But pretty soon other agencies are going to go, oh, the fishing's pretty good in that pond. I'm going to go over there. So what we teach is if you're going to specialize in a deliverable, you have to crisscross that with either an industry or an audience. You have to narrow who you use that tool for and become an expert both in that either industry or audience and the deliverable if you're going to stay differentiated for more than probably five years. Hmm, interesting. So an example of that, and correct me if I'm wrong, if you're, it's not good enough just to be a PR agency. You have to be a PR agency for moms or for dental practices or for uh, attractions and entertainment or, you know, hospitality or, you know, fill in the blank. But the whole goal is that you want to narrow the window so that there just aren't as many people for the prospect to find. And more importantly, that you know exactly where your prospects are because they're at a dental practice conference. They're at, you know, a, a technology conference. They are at a conference for reaching, you know, women over 40, whatever it is. But you know where to go to find your prospects because if you're a generalist, everybody, every butcher, baker, and candlestick maker could be a client. So then how do you customize your offer? How do you customize your lead gen tools? How do you customize the stories you tell, your case studies? It's a lot easier to do that when the window of who you care about is smaller. So people might argue, especially people who are just starting out in the agency spaces, that you might be pigeonholing yourself for being a PR agency just for dentists. Is that yep. true? Are you going to run out of prospects that you can do business with? No, it's, it's, it is it's a often held belief. Um, but the reality is what you're saying is we're going to go an inch deep and a mile wide covering that much space. And what we're saying is no, go a mile deep and an inch wide and just drill deeper. So think about for an average agency, because one of the challenges in agencies is if you have too many clients who are too small, then they will nibble you to death and it's really hard to be profitable. So the average agent, the ideal agency size, regardless of if you have one employee or 5,000 employees is 20 to 25 clients. <clears throat> the only difference is how big are the clients? What are their buildings, right? But you don't want 500 clients. So if I say to you, think about how many dental practices there are in your market alone. And by the way, you don't want to be geographically pigeonholed. You want to be able to have clients all over the country or the world. The more narrow your niche, the less your geography matters. Mm -hmm. And so now you don't have to only serve a local market. You can serve all of the residential real estate developers in the U.S. or whatever it may be, because now you have a depth of expertise. And there are so if there is if there's a pool of a thousand to 20,000 businesses in that niche, you're good. Okay. We uh, busted that rumor, that myth. Good. Yep. So you should pick a specific niche. You're not going to run out of people. It actually makes it easier yeah. to sell too. Uh, Ab and you can, absolutely. And you can right. charge much more. Right. Sure. Think about it this way. If you had to go to the doctor to get a flu shot, you're not going to drive by 12 doctors to get a flu shot. A general practitioner is great. Right. You have a brain tumor. You're going to hop on a plane and go to Mayo Clinic or John Hopkins or someplace else. And you are never going to ask that brain surgeon what he costs. You're yeah. going to say to your doctor, who's the best of the best. And right. that's you're not right. bargain hunting for the cheapest right. brain surgeon. So, that's right. So, so it's the same thing in our world is that when you're a generalist, there are a lot of generalists. And so then again, we get back to you have to compete on price or speed or something that has nothing to do with the quality of your work. And you certainly can't charge a premium. But when you build a reputation around a niche and you're known as the, the fill in the blank guy, whatever that is, or fill in the blank you know, lady, all of a sudden now you, the perception of your value is much higher and you can just charge more. Super because valuable. honestly, you're worth more. You know more. 
Yes. Yeah, if you can produce the same result over and over again because you've done that a million times, right. Right. it helps. Right. Now, going back to starting a, a marketing agency, say you're choosing that niche, you're choosing that uh, avatar that you want to serve. Do you look out into the future and say, I think this is going to be a good place to position myself for the next 10 years? Because there's a lot of different sub genres under that marketing mm -hmm. umbrella it could be a TikTok ads agency is that going right. to be a thing in 10 years so how right. do you how do you think about choosing what that thing is that you're going to specialize in so that's the danger of starting with the deliverable rather than the industry or the audience so mm -hmm. let, let's just use our dental practice example right yes if you know let, let's say you worked at a dental practice or you uh we have we have an agency in one of our peer groups her husband was a dentist. So she lived for the first 20 years of her marriage, helping him market his dental practice and ended up launching an agency that focused on dental practices. So if you start with something you know, an industry you know, an audience you know, then you're going to figure out what those people need in terms of the deliverable. And that has the legs because even if the dental practices don't need TikTok anymore, they need something that you and I have never even heard of before. You still have that depth of expertise in the, in the, in the industry. Now, mm. if you start with, I'm going to be a TikTok agency and I'll figure out who we specialize with later, that's okay. But you got to get to that specialization quick because TikTok or fill in the blank, it doesn't matter what we're talking about, has a, has a window of time before it, I mean, Think about all of the technology and all of the channels that have come and gone, even since you started your agencies, yes. right? And so you have to be really careful about doubling down on, on especially a technology-driven deliverable because the technology is kind of changing. So, you know, when you started your agencies, PR and lead gen, we're always people are always going to need PR and lead gen. People are always going to want to get their name out there like a PR firm does. And they're always going to want, going to want to drive prospects and leads and opportunities, but how you do it, right. That's going to change dramatically. I'm sure it's already changed from when it you is. started the business, right? So you have to 100%. be really careful. Yeah. That's great advice all around. All right. Let's talk a little bit about the life cycle that an agency typically goes through. I feel like yeah. I've gone through a lot of these moments in my life too, where it's like, oh man, this sucks. I think we've plateaued. I don't know how to reach that next level. Yep. So my guess is a lot of listeners are probably going through that same thing. Or if you're just starting, you're probably going to hit it very, very, very soon. Yeah. Starting an agency, the biggest problem that, that I, I felt immediately was I was, I hated the clients. And when I started the agency, I wasn't charging very much. And those clients seemed to be the, the toughest. So when you're yep. starting an agency, what are the, the most common pain points that people face and how do they overcome them? So when you start an agency, the biggest challenge is you're doing everything, right? Yes. You're wearing 27 hats. And the one hat you put on the least often is the agency owner hat. And it's the only job in the agency that if you don't do it, no one else is going to do it. And so when you think about that's typically for a smaller agency, that's biz dev, that's hiring, that's mentoring, that's training, that's building out the systems and processes. It's, it's really thinking about how you want the business to show up. It has nothing to do with doing the client work. But most agency owners, when they start, are so sucked into whatever they were good at. I'm a writer, I'm an art director, I'm a strategist, whatever it is. And it's not till you get to a certain size, and it's probably, I don't know, 10, 15 employees, that the agency owner can pull themselves out of the day-to-day -day grind enough to actually do their job. So that's in the beginning, the whole goal is to, to scale up as quick as you can so that you can focus on your job because no one else is going to do your job. What is that job? If you were to outline what an agency owner should be focused on in a perfect world, what are those things? So it starts with having a vision. It's it's really about being sort of that, you know, sort of in the EOS model, that visionary of here's where we're at today. Here's where we're going. I'm following the trends. I'm watching where I want to go. It's setting very clear, measurable benchmarks and then building systems, processes, and programs to hit those benchmarks. In the beginning, it is biz dev because you have to be a certain size before you can hire a salesperson or a sales team. Yes. So it's often that. And in, in a lot of cases, you are the face of the agency. So if you're going to be 
niched in an agency and your agency has expertise in, let's say, dental practices, using our example, then you're often the face of that. So you should be speaking on podcasts, being uh, speaking at conferences. You're the subject matter expert, writing content. Maybe you're writing a book, whatever it is, hosting a podcast, right? Those are things that an agency owner should be doing. But those are really hard things to do when client fires are happening behind the scenes. And your choice is either put out the fire of the person who's going to pay you and allow you to pay your people this month or do your job. And so the other place we see is a lot of agency owners burn out early because they're working 20 hour days trying to do both their job and everybody else's job. So an agency owner should be focused on biz dev, vision, mentoring, and mentoring changes. So when you're 10 or 15 or 20 people, you're mentoring everybody. When you're 50 or 100 people, you're mentoring the leadership team, and then you're teaching them how to mentor everybody else. But it really, so the the roles change, but sort of the focus is down. So it is vision, it's growth, it's profitability and finances, and it's really grooming and growing the team so that you can do more and more of what you're supposed to do. Right. So a lot of it's team building and then leadership, yeah. hiring right. people to replace you and doing that day-to-day -day client management and For things sure. that are bogging down your time yep. and then putting managers in place that can eventually uh, manage those people. Yep. Uh, couldn't, it's, we went through that same journey ourselves, and it took a lot of weight off of our shoulders when we stopped selling, when we stopped operating. Uh, and that's what got us through that first plateau, I think. Uh, so where do agencies hit that first plateau in your experience? Yeah, smaller than you'd think. So there are certain sizes of agencies where the weight of the new size agency cannot be borne by the foundation that got you to that size. So the first breaking point is 12 to 15 people. Hmm. And then the next breaking point is about 30 people. And then the next breaking point is about 50 people. And the next breaking point is about 150 people. And, and the breaking point is when your systems and processes no longer serve the agency or the client. So how you used to do traffic, how you used to move projects through the office, how you used to hire, right? All of those things, you do them very different if you're five people versus 50 people versus yes. 500 people. And so one of the things that can be frustrating for agency leaders is you, it's not a set it and forget it. You build it and then you ride it till you break it. And then you have to rebuild it. And then you ride it till you break it. And then you rebuild it. And so for some agency owners, they don't want to do that. And so they, they will choose to stay 10, 15 people that they're, they like that size and they're happy with the lifestyle business that it's, that how it serves them. And there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, one of the privileges of owning the joint is you get to do with your business what you want. So for some people, they want to scale quickly and they want to get to a certain size. And in most cases, that's to get to an exit, right? I want to roll it up. I want to buy some other agencies. I want to sell. I want to get to 10 million or 20 million of AGI and then I'm going to sell. For others, they're like, you know what? I, I love the client interaction. I love writing or whatever it is. So this is a lifestyle business for me. I'm going to make three, $400,000 a year. And when I'm done, I'm going to shut it down or I'm going to pass it off to one of my kids or I'm going to pass it off to a longtime employee, but I'm content not to keep breaking, riding, building, breaking, but right. So, okay. I, that there's nothing wrong with that. And so if somebody's listening and going, I don't want to be a 50 person agency or a 500 person agency, then don't, it's your, it's your business. It's okay to, I mean, the good news is even in a lousy year, a small agency owner still makes pretty good money compared to a lot of other jobs out there. And, you know, you can aspire to build something that you pass down to your family, or you can aspire to build something that just serves you and your family, or you can build something to sell and to keep growing. And all of those are okay answers. Yeah, I'd love to talk in a little bit about the buying and selling of agencies, which is mm. a, a topic that's been coming up more and more in our conversations. Uh, yeah. But first, I'd love to ask you about our current, I'd say, call it plateau. We're at around 60 people. We've got two offices, we've yep. got like 150 clients, and we've been at this plateau for a little, a little bit like eight months or so. And like you said, we don't really want to break things. The question I want to ask you is, does it ever make sense for an agency that specializes like us in PR to 
add other services, to add new audiences, instead of trying to expand and do more, trying to serve them in other ways. So a couple questions. What's your client churn like? Uh, I believe our average client is with us for seven months and we, most of them are on month to month agreements. We try and get them longer, but that is one of our selling points. Okay. So the, the, so that's a challenge because what you're doing is you are constantly filling the hole or the gap that they leave. And so even though you're selling a lot, you're just replacing them. And so the reality is for most agencies, even no matter how systemized you are, it's tough to be profitable right from the get-go. It takes a couple months to get a client to sort of behave the way the client needs to behave, to get all the systems and processes, to get the data, to get the assets. So let's just say for your agency, you really have it dialed in. And the first 30 days are a loss. The second 30 days are you typically break even. And by then you're making money. That means you're break, only making money for five months before you have to go replace that. So it would be interesting to spend some time thinking about why you have the churn that you have. What is happening? What, what, what is the client expecting that they're not getting that would allow them to go, you know what, after seven months, I'm going to tap out, I'm done. Because when you think about it, they've made an investment too. They've gotten to know you, they've gotten to know the people. So what is it that causes them to leave? And are they leaving for another agency? Are, have they learned all they have to learn and now they've brought it in house? Did you open up the curtain a little too wide and they can do it themselves. Like there's, there's all kinds of questions around that. So that'd be number one. Number two is what's your churn on the employee side? Churn on the employee side is very good. Um, okay. I don't know the exact numbers. I'm not in the HR day to day, but right. I, th I think that's very good. You don't have a lot of turnover there. Okay. No. So, that, all right. So that's great. So to answer your question, do you have an industry or an audience niche or are you doing PR for the butcher, the baker, and the candlestick maker? I don't want to say butcher, baker, candlestick maker because there's certain industries that we hyper-target. For example, I have a medical background. So a lot of our marketing, a lot of our uh, copywriting is for the medical niche. When we're targeting, we send them to a medical PR page. Same thing with legal and same thing okay. with software and technology. Okay. Uh, but yes, we do serve all of those industries. And one thing that I, I, I definitely want to bring up, because I feel like a lot of agencies are going to resonate with this, is PR is a very kind of campaign-based thing. It right. doesn't really give them, we're not generating leads for them. We're not generating sales for them. Uh, so in order for them to really want to stay, they're going to have to see a massive change in their business. Right. Uh, on an ongoing basis. Well, they which have is, to be able to correlate, right? Yes. They have to correlate what you did to something downstream that generates opportunity and revenue. Yes. And so one of the things we're seeing in the, in the industry is the agencies that do countable work. I give you $2, I get $4 of leads or sales or whatever that, that I, can, I can prove to my boss or my board or my wife or whoever yes. that I'm spending this money wisely because I'm getting an ROI on it. That's tougher with a PR firm. Yeah, this so is why on we the started PR the lead side, generation agency. Right. On the PR side, the argument might be, okay, we do need to add some more countable services that tie to the PR. So again, maybe it's SEO, maybe it's other things, maybe so we can start showing that, yes, we placed this story, or yes, we helped you give this speech, or yes, we did this PR deliverable, which then resulted in this kind of traffic. And then we also helped you figure out what what you want to have on the website that gets someone to stay longer than 30 seconds or gets them to click into the second or third page or whatever, because now you've got, now you've got proof points that this nebulous PR thing you did actually had an ROI. So on the PR side, yeah, maybe you do want to add again, some countable services, but yeah. I would argue that the other thing that you should think about doing is Maybe you drop whichever of those three niches that you mentioned, the medical, the legal, and the software, right? Technology. Yeah. Maybe because because by the way, those are ginormous. So yes. a, a niche might be plastic surgeons, not all medical devices, hospitals, doctors, fill in the blank. So maybe you narrow down because I'm guessing if you looked at your medical, your legal, and your technology, there are sub niches in there where you have some great stories to tell. Yes, so again, do. let's say it's plastic surgeons in the medical, right? Or it's, you know, um, 
on the legal side, it's estate planning, whatever it may be. I would narrow the niche. I would start getting hyper-focused on a subset of who you've been serving. And then I would ask myself, okay, if it is plastic surgeons, because let's think, let's think about that's often private pay, right? It's often not insurance covered. So now do I combine some of our lead gen experience with the PR and offer them an opportunity to start creating appointments or inquiries or whatever? And you'll know what else you should add when you get a little more narrow in your niche. Right. Figure out what their pain points are and then go and, and figure out those services. Them. Yeah. Makes sense. Yeah. All right, Drew, let's talk a little bit about buying and selling agencies. I know this yeah. is something you do a lot of within your company. We do. And something that a lot of agency owners are unsure about because yeah. it's not a software company. You can't hand over the keys and this will run itself. A lot of times agencies are dependent on the founder of that agency being in their day to day. If I were to sell my agency today, I don't know what would happen. Uh, and right. we're pretty self-sufficient, but still me and my co-founder stepping out would be a massive loss to the agency. Right. How does an agency sell and transition smoothly? And what does that process look like? Yeah. So first of all, it's not a quick process. So the transaction itself can be quick, but it is a thoughtful process that you have planned for some time. A lot of times we're working with an agency five years before the agency act, the agency owner actually wants to transact, helping them build the business basically to be self-sufficient without them. Our whole goal is for the agency owner to be irrelevant to the business. And that takes time. Yeah. So it gets back to what we were talking about before. If you can't do your job because you're doing the AE's job or the art director's job or the you know digital code guy's job, you can't sell your agency because the whole point of them buying it is you don't want to be there. And frankly, they don't want you there. So that's problem number one. So we have to get you out of the day to day. Then we have to figure out how to duplicate everything you do inside the business so that really you are irrelevant so that you could be there for three or four months, maybe six to make the clients and the employees feel like, okay, dad's still here. Everything's fine. Right. And then you start going to four days a week and three days a week and two days a week. And then you kind of fade off and you go to whatever your next chapter is, but that doesn't happen by accident and it doesn't happen quickly. So first of all, it takes some planning and some really careful sort of strategizing about how to, and this is hard for our ego, right? We started the business. We want to be important to the business. So it's also honestly some psychology coaching and some other things to help the owner go, okay, I get why I have to be ir irrelevant in my own business for me to get out of my business. So it's that. Then it is about, there are certain characteristics of an agency that makes it attractive. One of them is niching. One of them is not having a client that's more than 20 or 25% of your AGI. One of them is not having too many piddly little clients that can suck the profit dry. One of them is, is there a leadership team intact that is running the business day in and day out? Another one is how much money does the agents, this is one that a lot of agency owners don't understand. Most agency owners underpay themselves to pay everybody else, or they're like, well, I won't take a paycheck this time. One of the biggest factors in the valuation of your agency is how the agency owner is paid. Why? Because no one's buying your agency because they need a job at an agency. They're buying an agency to build wealth. And if you can't prove that you built wealth outside of the agency while you owned it, then why would I think that I can do that? So one of the biggest mistakes agency owners make is they underpay themselves. And I'm not talking W-2. There's a lot of ways for an agency owner to take money out of the business, which is a whole different conversation. But when we go in and do evaluation, we do what's called normalizing. So we go in and we sort of add back all of the ways an agency owner runs, runs money to their pocket from the business. The, the agency owns their car, the agency pays for their travel, all kinds of other things. And really, you want to be taking home a minimum of half a million dollars a year. And you want to be able to prove that you've done that for a period of time. So again, when we come in and we have a five-year runway, one of the first things we do to say to the agency owners, look, we got to figure out a way to give you a raise. Got to get more money out of this business. And you need to start building your wealth outside of the business. You, a lot of you leave too much money inside the business and retained earnings. There's lots of silly mistakes, but the point is it's a plan and it's a plan that you have to work for a period of time. And then... You have to figure out why, why are you selling? Are you selling for legacy? Like, do you, are you willing to discount the business? Because 
a kid started working for you when he was 22 and he's 35 now and he's been loyal and he's been with you. And even though he's not related to you, he's like a son to you. And so you want him to have, be the next gen or do you have a, do you actually have a child that you think, or a younger sibling or somebody else that you think wants to take on the business. So it is a legacy. Is it a legacy sale? Is it a, I want to be, you know, ridiculously rich sale. And by the way, there's nothing wrong with any of these motivations. Yeah. A lot uh, of different it, factors. Yeah. Right. So you have to figure that out because that's going to tell you who's the most likely buyer. And then we have to build the agency for that buyer. Even though we don't know exactly who they are, we know what they are, right? They're an investment firm. They're a, you know, they're a, a bigger agency that wants a PR, that wants to add PR to their offerings. And so they can just gobble your agency up and plug it into their traditional agency. And now they're, now they have something new to offer their clients. So it really starts with having a, a plan and a vision and then kind of just working the plan. But most agencies don't, most, most agency owners don't do that. And which means they don't sell. They end up just closing the door when they're done. Yeah, it's a sad thought. Yeah. Uh, and there's a lot of talk about multiples, right? Software companies get 10x. Agencies obviously don't get quite that mostly. What does a typical agency exit look like? If I wanted to sell my agency for $10 million, how much yeah. revenue EBITDA would my agency need to be pulling in? So... Uh, that is a little like saying, hey, Drew, how much does it cost to build a house, right? Depends on where you're building it. Depends on if you already own the land. Depends on if it's a three-bedroom, three-bathroom. Depends on if you want a pool. Depends on what the taxes are. So it depends on all the factors I just listed before. It also depends on size. It depends on the longevity of your staff. It depends on, are you a project client? Right or a project agency. So if you're if your clients are in and out in a year, you're not going to get the multiple that you will if you have multi year contracts with your clients. There's, right. So there's all these other factors. So I would say that the average EBITDA multiplier is three to seven, and where you fall in that is going to be, you know, dependent on all kinds of factors. And by the way, it also assumes that you're dropping ten to twenty percent to the bottom line consistently year over year after you pay yourself what I was talking about before, after you take care of your people. So it, there's a lot of moving parts to building an agency that you're going to be able to sell someday, but it's absolutely doable. You just need to plan for it in advance. Okay. That's good to know that it's doable. Sounds realistic. Now who's buying my agency? Is it private equity? Is it other agencies? Who are you typically seeing that's gobbling up these smaller agencies? Yeah. Again, it kind of depends on the answer is yes to all of them. <laughs> um, so it depends on your goal. So for example, there are a lot of companies out there that are buying a bunch of smaller agencies. And when I say smaller, I'm talking 200 people or less, and they're rolling them up into something big so they can sell it to either venture capital or whatever it may be. There are venture capitalists that are buying all kinds of different businesses. So we just helped an agency sell. So the, the venture capital firm was buying agencies. They wanted to be basically the Costco to the legal industry. And so mm -hmm. they, they had all the different kind of elements that a, that a legal firm would need. And they wanted a marketing firm that had a specialty in legal because they wanted to put that inside the Costco. So you can come here, you can one-time shop, you can get all of the things you need. You can get your partnership papers, you can get this, you can get that, get your marketing. So in that case, yeah, it was a venture, it was a venture capital company. In most cases, it's either going to be an employee or it's going to be another agency. Okay, super helpful. Uh, so Drew, talk, talk to me about what you do now with the Agency Management Institute. Uh, yeah. If you were to help my agency with uh, certain services, what would that look like? Yeah. So AMI basically recognizes that most agency owners are accidental business owners. So they, in most cases, somebody who starts an agency, worked at agencies, got laid off, while they were waiting to find a job, they have a computer. They're like, what the heck? I'm just going to, I'm going to just do some freelance work. All of a sudden they get so much freelance work that they have to hire somebody to help them. And the next thing they know, they, know they have 15 employees yeah. and they're like, oh my God, I'm running a business. But nobody ever taught them how to run the business. And there are very specific things about the agency business that are different than general businesses. So if you're working with a generalist accountant, I promise you 
you are making some mistakes. If you're not working with an accounting firm who understands agencies, you're missing the boat. There, there's we actually call it agency math. If you're not running the business by agency math, you've got you are you are leaving money on the table in a plethora of ways. So what we do is we come in and we teach you how to run the business of your business. So finance, HR, process, biz dev, succession planning, mentorship, all of those things. So we don't teach you how to do PR. We don't teach you how to do lead gen. We assume you're good at that. It's really how do you run your business better so that you make more money and you keep more of the money you make. And so we have all kinds of free things like you. We have a podcast. We do all kinds of other things. We have workshops. We have an annual conference. We do a ton of consulting and coaching. We do sort of our version of traction, which we call agency advantage. So we've taken the core elements of traction, which were built for a manufacturing firm, and we've customized those for agencies. Uh, we do a ton of succession work. We help agencies find other agencies to buy. We help agencies find buyers. We help facilitate up the purchase between an employee and a founder. So we come alongside agencies in a lot of different ways and, and teach them how to be better business people like they are good agency people. Are you able to serve agencies at a variety of stages? You mentioned the accidental freelancer that now runs an agency. Uh, yeah. At what point does somebody become a good fit for AGI, AMI? Yeah. So honestly, we work with them all along the way. So we work with agencies that are two people and we work with agencies that are, you know, hundreds of people. Um, but the this earlier in their process that they can learn some of the basics that they can learn from a workshop or two, that's going to set them up for a lot of success. So we'll have a lot of people who will come to, we teach a workshop called Money Matters, where all we do is talk about money things for two days. And I'll have somebody who's owned their agency for 20 years and come up to me and say, God, I wish I had done this 15 years ago. I think about all the money that would have been in my bank account, but I didn't know. So, you know, the sooner the better, but um, we work with agencies you know, third, fourth generation agencies, agencies that are ready to, you know, roll up into, into a, a, a bigger holding company size agency, but probably most of our clients are a hundred employees or less. Cool. That fits us. Yeah. We might have to have a conversation. Yep. Yeah. Happy uh, to do now, it. Drew, you've got an event coming up May 21st, 22nd in Denver, build that's a better right. agency summit. Yep. So that's our annual conference. Pretty much everybody there is an agency owner or agency leader, and everybody who steps on a stage, whether it's a keynote stage, a breakout stage, we do discussion roundtables where you, the agency owner, the attendees show up as both the teacher and the student. Everybody there is a subject matter expert specifically to agencies. So we're going to talk about uh, pricing strategies. We're going to talk about one of the interesting keynotes this year is going to be about change fatigue and how everybody is just so exhausted and how do you fire up your team and how do you fire up your clients to do new things when every time they turn around, they're doing something new. Uh, you know, of course, we're going to be talking about AI because everybody's talking about AI. Got to love um, AI. Yep. We're, we're going to be talking about money things. We're going to be talking about biz dev things. We're going to be talking about how, when, and where to get clients to give you more money. Like what, what does that take to do? How do you grow your existing book of business? Because remember, 60 to 70% of your net new revenue should come from existing clients. So if, if you're not hitting that mark, then you know you're leaving money on the table. So it's just two days of learning from each other, with each other. It's, you know, it's a small conference. We keep it small on purpose. So it's 400 people. Uh, so um, it's, it is about sort of connecting to a community of, of people who do what you do and learning from them as much as you're learning from the people from the stage. Cool. I'm going to try and convince my co-founder, Scott, to come with me to that. We do love Denver. Yeah, uh, and I'll put the link place to that to down in the show notes. Great place to be. Yeah, uh, Drew, for people who loved what you had to say about agencies and want to learn more, you know what? Actually, I don't know anybody who teaches agency-related stuff the way that you do. Uh, do you have uh, a LinkedIn page, Instagram page, YouTube page where you teach agency-related stuff where people can follow along? Yeah, we do. So if you head over to agencymanagementinstitute.com, you can find all the social links. So we do a lot of, we have a YouTube channel with teaching videos every week. Uh, we have a podcast with a new episode every week. All of that stuff obviously is is free to access. 
uh, you'll find us pretty active on LinkedIn. Uh, and uh, we have a private Facebook group that you can get in with. There's, I think, about 1800 agency owners in there and they're wow. actively talking about everything. So somebody today was like, Hey, you know, how, how do you decide if you have an employee that's in the same role for the last three years, do they get a raise? How big of a raise? And now they're all debating that in the same time, somebody was talking about how much work can an AE manage? And so there's all these discussions where agency owners, we, we jump in and teach, but agency owners are also sharing their experience and knowledge as well. So there's lots of ways to, to sort of tap into the AMI community and, and learn more. I wish I knew about this stuff early on, probably would have saved ourselves so much headache. Uh, so yes, if you're listening to this and running an agency, starting an agency, get in there, start consuming, start interacting with other agency owners. There's uh, so many problems and plateaus and roadblocks that you hit along the way. So having a network of people that have done it and are doing it makes everything so much easier. So Drew, thank you so much for spending some time with me. Uh, loved what we had to, to talk about. I'm looking forward to talking to you a little bit more about growing our agency. So thanks again. You bet. My pleasure. Thanks for having me.